nods that okay so thank you for joining us today for our first ever findings launch webinar for the race report it's a real pr privilege that we as an organization have been facilitating in a leadership role like progressing the sector's work on this um, lack of diversity in terms of racial and ethnic minoritized people working in the environment climate nature and sustainability sector um, there's a real need for driving this change and transforming the sector in terms of both diversity and creating greater inclusion in the sector we know that this diversity piece is just one part of the puzzle and that in driving this forward for increasing transparency around the lack of racial diversity in the environment, climate, sustainability and nature sector, that we hope to also be working closely with organisations in the sector and their funders to improve the culture change around transforming se the sector to become more inclusive and representative of those who are most implicated by the climate and ecological crisis. We know that those most implicated are those least responsible for the climate and ecological crisis. And therefore we need to not just have numbers, but voices in terms of the spaces which are working to take action and create change in how we address and deliver on climate and ecological justice. Um, this came about from various sets of data, but in 2020 to 2021, the Office for National Statistics released data that highlighted that people who identify as environmental professionals were made up of four point, um, comprised 4.8% of people of colour, compared to the average of 12.6% for all other professions in the UK. And so the race report aims to increase transparency and drive forward change around this. Um, I'd just like to say a massive thanks to Esme Fairburn Foundation, who are a huge supporter of this work and have provided funding for us to be able to progress this and support the sector on this work. Um, and also to Synchronicity Earth, who've provided supportive funding as well. Um, we'd also like to thank the, um, the founding partners for this. So that's Hindu Climate Action, Nature Youth Connection and Ed Education and South Asians for Sustainability, as well as our advisory groups ongoing support with how we've shaped the race report. So this launch webinar is going to cover sharing and presenting the data for 2022, how it worked and the key findings for 2022. Then we're going to follow that straight away with a panel reflection on the 2022 race report, as well as a Q&A for those of you who are here. Um, you may have noticed that the chat functionality is not working because we're in a webinar setting for this, but we do have the Q&A open. So please, please make use of that. You can add your questions throughout the session and we'll work to try and address as many of the questions as we can in the given time that we have. Um, it might be that we can't answer all of them at once, but we'll do our best. Um, and last but not least, I should probably introduce my colleagues who are here with me who have been working really hard on the race report. So I am Meg Baker, I'm co-director of inclusion and climate justice at SOS UK. And um, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Manu. Manu, do you wanna unmute and just introduce yourself? Um, hello, everybody. Uh, really good to be here. And uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm Manu. I am co-director of inclusion and climate justice with Meg at uh, SOS. Uh, I'm also the director of Nature Youth Connection and Education, which is a founding uh, member of the steering group that's brought this, uh, this report about. And I'm uh, really looking forward to sharing the findings with you and also uh, fielding some of your questions. Cool, and Rachel, quick intro to, from you and then Rajni and Francesca. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Drayson. I'm the Head of Research and Impact at SOS UK. Um, so I've been overseeing the data collection process involved in the race report. Um, I'll pass to Rajni. Hi, I'm Rajni. I work at SOS UK and I'm a project coordinator for inclusion and climate justice and education. I'll pass on to Francesca. Hello everybody, um, I'm Francesca. 
I also am a project coordinator for the climate justice and inclusion team and for the engagement team at SOS UK. Thank you. Now straight over to Rachel and Francesca who are going to present the findings for 2022. I'll just uh, share my screen. And then we can get going. Sorry, it's sharing the wrong thing. Sorry, <laughs> it won't seem to share. My actual file is only sharing a desktop. But let me just completely start again. And I think it's getting confused by the fact that I've got two screens open. Hopefully you can now see a presentation. Can someone just confirm? Yes, okay, great. So we're just going to um, take you through um, some of the findings of the 2022 race report. Um, so first of all, I will talk a bit um, about the process um, and how it worked this year before handing over to Francesca, who will take you through some of the key findings. So in terms of how it worked this year, we launched the campaign back in April 2022 um, with the deadline of mid-September um, for organisations in this sector to sign up, um, register their interest and then submit their data. Um, throughout the kind of period that the campaign was open, we had 175 organisations signing up to be part of the campaign. Um, throughout this period, organisations could collect and collate and then submit their data to the race report through an online form. Um, and this included data in three categories. Um, so section A, um, which was a mandatory section, um, asked information about the administration of their organisation and organisational characteristics. Um, section B, um, was the main section that the race report focuses on, um, which is the race and ethnicity data for staff and their government's bodies. And section C was an optional section, um, which asked organizations questions about their policy strategy and different actions that they're taking on diversity and inclusion. Um, by the deadline, we had 94 organisations submitting data in at least one of these sections in 2022, um, but 91 of those were able to provide data in that section D on race and ethnicity data. Um, it's worth noting that two organisations submitted a federated response, um, and due to the way that their data was collected and submitted, um, we've had to count this as one organisation, even though it kind of um, might represent um, multiple different organisations with un under the same umbrella. Um, it's worth just flagging that of the um, 175 that signed up, there were 80 or 81 organisations um, that didn't um, submit their data, um, for example, due to a lack of capacity. Um, but we hope in future to encourage those organisations to progress through to the data submission stage. So when we're looking at the data, um, what you're actually looking at is um, data that organisations have submitted in the number, in the format of the number of staff according to the headcount. Um, what we've done is total the numbers across all organisations submitting data for each race or ethnic identity, and then the total for that category, um, and use that to achieve a percentage. Um, it's, we wanted to note that within the report, racial and ethnic identities have been grouped for analysis, um, but we don't mean to imply that one group is more or less important than any other, or that the experiences of individuals within the grouping are uniform. When we move on to the presentation that Francesca will share with you, um, it's worth just noting the um, different groupings that we've used um, in presenting the data. Um, so there's one category which is named people of color and racially or ethnically minoritized groups, um, and the individual race and ethnic identities included within that group are outlined in this yellow box. We've also grouped um, all the white um, ethnicities and identities that were included um, in the data collection um, as one category as well. Um, but there's also any other ethnicity um, which we were obviously unable to categorize. 
um, and also individuals who did not disclose the information to their organization. Some points to bear in mind um, as we look at the data um, is worth noting that the data was be collected and submitted voluntarily um, by organisations. Um, it's likely to have been collected using different methods and at different times, depending on the processes that um, each organisation um, either had embedded already in their practices or instigated in order to participate in the race report. Um, within each category, you'll see that there's a significant proportion of staff who didn't disclose their identity. For example, in, when we get onto the overall staff category, that reaches 27%. Um, so therefore, the 2020 report isn't really a perfect representation of the sector, but a really important first step in measuring and tracking diversity. Um, and we hope to work with organisations that are taking part in the process in future years um, to improve that data collection and reporting process. OK, so I'm just going to hand over to Francesca now to um, go through some of the key findings. Thank you, Rachel. I um, just want to start off by saying a thank you to everyone that participated, as we wouldn't be able to make this possible without your full commitment to the process. So thank you again. Um, and just to note as well that the data we're presenting today includes everyone who works for environmental organisations or funders, from the HR team to the finance team. It's not just those that have environmental roles. So from here, we can see the breakdown of what racial, ethnic diversity of overall staff from this, there's only 7% of staff that identify as POC and racially um, ethically minoritized groups, this being the second smallest category in the demographic. Um, this slide shows a more detailed breakdown of the data for overall staff, showing each racial and ethnic identity without grouping. White British has the highest overall staff headcount with 43%, and the next highest is people not choosing to disclose information with 27%. We can see that the identity, we can see that identity has POC. We can see that those that identify, sorry, as POC and racially ethnic, ethically minoritized groups are all 1% or below in headcount. Um, Taking from the national data from the annual population survey gathered from 2021 to 2022 by the Office of National Statistics, we can see that the data submitted by environmental charities and funders through the 2022 race report highlights the gap in diversity within this sector. Whilst 14% of the UK's working population that are currently in employment identify as Black, Asian or other minority ethnic identities, compared to the 7% of employees identify as people of colour or racially or ethnically minoritized identities within the race report. Um, so here we, we have an overview of the, di of the different categories of staff organisations um, and what they were asked to submit for data. Different numbers of organisations were able to report data for the different categories of staff, depending on what the data they collected within their organisation. Some of the data that are really stood out to us are as follows. 68%, sorry, not 68%, 68 participating organisations reported data for permanent staff with this matching overall staff at 7% POC and racially or ethnically minoritised groups. Only 41 participating organisations submitted data for non-permanent staff, reporting 10% to be POC and racially, ethnically minor and minoritised groups. Um, and then obviously the others that show 5% of people managers from 57 um, organisations identify as um, people of colour, racially, ethnic, ethnic, ethically minoritised groups. 7% of those um, from 57 organisations are senior meet leaders. 14% of those from 52 organisations are non-permanent non staff who received contract extensions or were made permanent. 9% of staff who perceived promotions in 2021 coming from 28 organisations um, and from 62 organisations, 11% of governance trustee board members um, 
identify as POC and racially ethnically minoritized groups. Um, across 57, oh sorry, data from 62, seven, sorry, <laughs> like that, that's actually me. Um, data from 62 UK environmental organizations um, showed that POC represent 11% of those governance trustee boards, which according to the most recent data surpass the wider charity sector average of 8%. Um, so within the race report, organizations were also asked to report on their action on diversity, um, equality and inclusion in five areas, which are shown below. This table outlines the most and least commonly reported actions in each area. Um, you can see how many organizations are doing things partially towards diversity and inclusion, but the fewer are in positions of having fully implemented and operational actions. For example, 61% say that, say they have partially implemented a racial, a race equity, diversity and inclusion strategy, but only 21% say that they say this is fully implemented and, op and operational in their organizations. Whilst the data submitted by participating organizations show that some good practices are becoming, are becoming commonplace, it is clear that more substantial and widespread action is needed to ensure organizations' diversity is reflective of the broader picture across the UK's population. Um, I'll now pass on to the panel for some further reflection. Um, thank you, Francesca, and uh, a lot to a lot to digest there. I think uh, when we got started with this process, we we knew that we would be dealing with a lot of new data, a lot of data that didn't exist. A big part of the process has been recognizing that we are behind some nations, uh, definitely behind the United States in creating a transparency card, as it were, for the sector. Uh, as Rachel pointed out in her introduction, this this is this is just the beginning, really. Uh, this has been in some ways an experiment. Uh, we know that the level of data that we could have collected could have been a lot wider. We know that some of the data doesn't necessarily dig into inclusion practice, and there are already a couple of questions in in the chat which point to uh, to what organizations could be doing or not doing. And we hope that that sort of comes out in the, in the future reports and in future ways of, uh, of presenting this data and, and working with organizations. I guess um, before we get going with the panel discussion, we, uh, I'd like the, uh, the panel to introduce themselves. And, and I think uh, just very briefly why they have chosen to be involved with this with this project. So I'll um, I'll start off with Shravani. If you can unmute yourself, thank you. There you go. Um, hopefully unmuted. Wave at me if you can't hear me. Um, so for those of you um, who um, I've not had a chance to meet, um, my name is Shravani. Um, I founded an agency called Full Color, um, and we work on strategic um, big systems change projects around different topics to do with equity, diversity and inclusion. And in the context of the race report, probably the most significant of those is we developed the route map um, commissioned by Wildlife and Countryside Link um, to really support the sector in moving forwards to becoming more ethnically diverse. And actually issues to do with inclusion and culture were very much at the heart of the route map that we We've developed for the sector and but so was data and the reason I'm on the panel is because um, I agree with Meg that um, voices are important but data is absolutely crucial if we are to define and take the, the right actions that will move us further faster so data is crucial so massive congratulations to SOS and I look forward to the panel discussion in a minute. Uh, thank you, Shravani. Um, Vibs, would you like to uh, come on next? Yep. Hi. Um, hi, all. Thank you very much for having me on today. I am Vibs Bhatia, uh, founder of South Asians for Sustainability, a community-based organization um, 
in empowering South Asian people um, to enter this space and also raise awareness about sustainable living in a culturally relevant way. Um, I'm also a senior consultant within the climate change and sustainability practice at Ernst & Young. Um, and I think for me, um, the bridge between community, um, private sector, public sector, all of us um, comes when we have the data in front of us. Um, climate justice is very, very important and dear to me. And I think the report is amazing to see um, and more needs to come of it for sure. Um, a lot more engagement in future. But um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to be a part of the process and uh, I'll uh, pass back to Manu um, now. Great. Thank you, uh, Vibs. Thank you, Shavani. We've uh, been introduced to uh, Rajneet, who's a core member of the team that's delivered on the report already. I guess my first question is to you, Shravani. You you work a lot in inclusion and you work with organizations around uh, system change. Now, how does how does this report to you fit into that picture of how we could start to get system change around equity and diversity within the sector? Um, oh, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, coughing. Um, I think it fits in in a number of ways. Um, one of the things which is crucial in planning change journeys, I'm going to take a sip so I don't cough again, is if you don't know where you're starting, you cannot plan a journey to where you want to get to. It would be the equivalent of me being asked, how do you get to Glasgow? My answer would be different if I was starting in London or if I was starting in Timbuktu. So this is absolutely crucial for organisational change and sector change is knowing where you're starting from, which is why that fits into systemic um, change. The other thing, if I, if I can be brutally frank, <laughs> is that um, everyone who is on this call is on this call because they care about these issues and they really want to make a contribution towards change but not everybody is as equally committed um, to that change there i've just said it shoot me now um, and so the data actually helps us make the case now i know that there will be a lot of people who say we shouldn't have to make the case it's the right thing to do we have to do it because it's right not everybody would share that view i obviously share that view that's why i do what i do so i think data is a crucial part of that process of saying you cannot ignore this issue here is the data and then when you connect the data to why um, it, it's absolutely crucial to make change um, for the right reasons, but also because of the incredible impact it can have in addressing the issues for which climate justice and environment uh, organisations exist. When you add all those things together, it is such a compelling, um, a such compelling argument. So I think that's why those are some of the main reasons why I think the data is so so crucial to systemic change. I hope I've answered your question, Manu. Uh, great, thank you, Shavani. Before you unmute yourself, I, I, I guess I wanted briefly to hear from you. Did anything stick out for you in the data? Did anything really surprise you or, you know, kind of prick your ears up? Sure, I'm happy to share. And if I'm looking down, it's because I made some notes. So I, I'd, I'd remember some of the things that I really wanted to say. I think for me that there are there are two things that really um, shouted out. Um, I really wanted to give a massive virtual high five to the 94 organizations that took the time and put the effort into providing data. That is phenomenal because of what that shows is sector leadership and it shows courage. And I, I know this year we're not publicizing, you're not publicizing who has provided data and what their individual data says, but that leadership that those organizations provided is, is absolutely vital uh, and the thing that struck me about that um, in, in a very brief e email exchange with Rachel I was asking about the makeup of those people that that responded and I was 
delighted but surprised and curious about the fact that actually a larger proportion of smaller organizations contributed and actually there were a number of larger organizations who chose not to contribute they op opted out and i'm really curious about how we have landed in that situation where the organizations which perhaps have the most capacity to engage in this work were amongst those that chose not to take part in this work. So for me, that was one really um, big um, um, thing that screamed out at me. I think the second thing that screamed out at me is, do you know, the devil is in the detail. Um, and I made, an, I'm not going to go through them all because we haven't got time, but I made a note of some of the things that really um, struck me about the data. And I'm very, very mindful that this is data from committed organizations who actually are demonstrating their commitment by taking part in 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 the search that you've done um but i find it really um i, I was curious again about so 66 percent of the organizations said that they had a dedicated senior leader responsible for named and responsible for progress on ed and i what are we doing to support those leaders how much do they actually know what are we doing to equip them to make the right decisions on uh, moving forward on edi um the fact that um 66% had um, a statement or were working towards producing a statement to commit to uh, addressing racism. What are the other third of organizations doing? I mean, so for me, um, a, a lot of it in reading, that, and there's, uh, there's loads more, I won't go through them all. Um, for me, the, the, the questions that the data rose in my brain that was my biggest takeaway. What is this data telling? Uh, and I really hope that in the discussion and in the work that SOS will do moving forward, that you're able to actually present some of those questions for inquiry that organizations might, would, might wish to ask themselves off the back of the data you've presented. I will stop talking. Uh, th thank you, Shavani. Uh, I just wanted to uh, come to you, Vibs, because you know we can't collect all the data and the data will never really show a true picture of what's going on. We, we know that this is potentially a small part of the sector that we've got the data for at the moment with the intention and the hope that it is a much bigger uh, piece of the pie next year. Uh, what other things would you like to see um, moving forward into 2023 in terms, not only in terms of what we are collecting and how the organizations are able to give that over to us, but what, what improvements do you want to see within the sector going forward? Thank you for the question. Um, so I think fundamentally a lot of what drives um, a lot of the data that we're seeing in this report, um, whether holistically representative or not, is that it's all driven in culture of individual organisations. And something that really stood out for me was the percentage of people who didn't feel comfortable reporting their background why is that what is it that within each of these organizations what culture is making them feel like they cannot or they they don't they don't feel comfortable in sharing that information and i think that rests fundamentally in the culture of individual organizations um within this sector but also more broadly speaking as well and that's something that i would love to see you know we that we actually get the data um and we encourage more people to actually feel comfortable um, in whatever capacity we can to share that um, with us. Um, another element I think that the generally the report really tackles well is something that's less considered generally within the sustainability kind of consulting side of things as well is the social element. Um, so in a lot of companies, um, in a lot of charities, you'll find diversity, inclusion, equity, culture is very much a HR thing. Um, and sustainability decarbonization environmental practice is always a different department and what i love to see in this report is that fundamentally being bridged and showing that they go hand in hand they impact one another particularly with topics like climate justice coming up in cop 27 um a lot of main conferences now talking about why and how people of color were seeing it with events like the flooding in pakistan um why those people are being um, more negatively impacted and what businesses, organizations and governments can do to tackle those issues. And I think fundamentally it comes down to those people being represented 
in the spaces where most impact can be made and most financial decisions can be made. So there's a lot here. And there's, like you said, this is an amazing start um, from a cultural perspective, from a general um, perspective of we're moving forward and bringing greater transparency compared to other places in the world. Um, but a lot yet to do and a lot more sectors and, and companies to engage with this because it is so important and vital um, to have the impact and change that we're hoping to see. Thank you, Vibs. I'm going to come back to some of the points that both you and Shravani have made uh, in, I guess, your introductory remarks. But uh, Rajneet, I, you've been key to collecting this data, to finding ways of us presenting it, and really the, the operational arm of the work that's, that's brought this report into, into existence. There have been difficulties and challenges in that. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit to what some of the challenges have been in, in bringing this data to, to the table? Um, yeah, uh, I think touching upon uh, what Bib said that uh, some individuals didn't want to disclose their um, identity. Um, I think also some of um, during the data collection, um, getting uh, participants to uh, get involved and un asking them to understand that this is a huge uh, deal it's quite significant in order to create a sector change um i do still have this one statistic that still pops into my head is that the environmental sector is the second least diverse sector in the uk and with that statistic i really want to change that with the race report um there are like so many organizations that are doing things right now in terms of strategies and policies that we've asked during our data collection um but there's also barriers to uh, individuals. Um, but with uh, organizations creating those strategies, um, encouraging uh, young people, young adults, people of color to enter the sector, um, if we keep maintaining that, I'm, sh I'm sure surely and slowly we can create that transformational change because the race support in itself is a catalyst to bridging the gap of diversity and inclusion. Um, so there are like small little um, areas that we still need to work on, but overall, I still think that the sector is uh, improving uh, slowly. Uh, th thank you. I want to I want to come back to you, uh, Shravani, um, because I think often we can confuse diversity with inclusion, and I get the sense from working within the sector and working within both of those areas that they're not the same thing. What we're being presented here is representation within the sector, which clearly points to diversity. What do you what do you think needs to be done, not only on a transparency level, but in terms of uh, how organizations can be can be shifting their perspective, shifting their practice to be more inclusive? Because clearly that's something that that needs to change as well. Yeah, uh, it's a really vital, vital question, Manu. What can organisations do to really become more inclusive? Um, one of the things which might kind of connect the two, I was as I was listening to Rajneet, um, as I often say now, I'm quite elderly. Um, and I've been through several generations of attempts at increasing diversity in all sorts of different sectors that I've been involved with over the years. Um, and as eggs is eggs, the, um, the drive is always how do we get young people in at the beginning of the career pipeline uh, so that we can get more young people and over time things will change. I'm living proof that that doesn't work. And yes, you've got to get more people in at the beginning of the pipeline, but the, one of the stats that really struck me from the research that you've done is how few people are actually doing any work around progression 
Um, and one of the things that you've talked about in the research is that um, of those respondents, uh, they have 7% um, people of colour. But I think it was, and correct me if the stat is wrong, someone, but 66, no, hang on, 63% of organisations that responded hadn't actually done anything to plan the progression routes for the people of colour who were already there. Um, and I, I connect that with your question about inclusion, Manu, is because people don't actually understand what inclusion is. And if we are to become more inclusive, people actually have to engage with what that word means. And when you say the word inclusion to, uh, organize, to people who aren't already in the work of doing the change, people sort of assume that it means it's, it's a synonym for friendly uh, and welcoming. And inclusion is not a synonym for welcoming. Um, it, is a, it is a very particular approach for how people interact with each other within organisations, how people recognise the different barriers that different groups of people face and therefore what you need to do to address some of those barriers. It's about being curious, it's about changing mindset, it's about changing how we behave in organisations, it's about changing the assumptions we make all of that is actually really quite challenging work because sometimes that work goes to the heart of how we view ourselves as people and how we might need to change how we think about how we show up as individuals within organizations i have to say when you engage with that work it is the best fun ever uh, and i think a lot of people are quite frightened by that work that that depth of work that's required but my gosh it's joyous work i mean it it really is joyous work and it makes an environment more um, uh, more effective and more buzzy and more joyful for everybody, not just uh, the most minoritized um, groups that within your organization. But you have to actually accept that that means that I might need to change um, and and that also takes a really um, particular type of leadership um, that requires some very strong capable leaders and we need to invest in leaders leaders aren't just born knowing how to do this stuff uh, people need to learn how to do it um, and so that does require a commitment for organizations i don't know what has that answered your question manu have i kind of covered what you wanted me to cover uh, you have and more thank you um, but I, I, I kind of want to come back to that point because we know that a lot of the organizations that voluntarily and courageously put their data forward uh, here are small organizations. And maybe I'll go to Vibs for this just because of time. But um, one of the things that I've definitely heard, not only in my SOS work, but in my consultancy work and attending conferences and, 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 and working with leaders and organizations, is the resource excuse we don't have enough resource to do the things you're asking us to do this sounds really expensive this sounds like we need somebody else on board uh what's a, what's what's your what's your response to that vibs i think fundamentally to put it brutal and short if people genuinely care they'll do what it takes and it's really not that difficult when you think of even from okay granted small organizations may have more agility for sure but every single organization even from a legislation perspective in the UK will have insights of their data as and when people join the companies and I understand for companies who've been around longer um, there may be some back data that needs to happen which takes a whole new process of engagement within organizations of um, explaining why the data is important, creating that comfort level for people to disclose. But ultimately, like, I, I feel, and this is something that popped up from the stats as well, when I was reading that the second highest percentage of people of colour was at board level, at 11%. Given the world we're in of showing something and, um, you know, creating this perception of whatever whether regardless of if it's genuine or not under the surface why is it that 11 percent of people of color in organizations are at the highest like where the most scrutiny lies now when you look at an organization you look first at the senior leadership where where for 
the racial, ethnic, um, different types of diversity, those percentages seem to be the highest in this cohort. But why is that, again, going that layer underneath? Is it, is it genuine change? Or is it more a tokenistic approach of we want to look a certain way and this will help us get to where we need to get to? Whatever the intention, I think it's great that we're making strides, but it, from an organizational perspective, really introspecting this is why this is important and making sure that those intentions are for the right reasons is equally as important as actually the transparency of this data, in my humble opinion. <laughs> hey, thank you, thank you, Vibs. There's um there's a question that's come in through the the Q and A, and we've probably got about a minute or so to somebody to chip in and start to answer it. It's a big, big question, and. Uh, it was, what is the biggest single act you would encourage organizations to undertake to close the racial gap between our current state and the UK average? If you, if you could, you know, if you could, if you could slide a, a magic pill into the sector and, and what, what would that be? I think for me, it would be outreach into organizations, communities that are not being, um, are not being engaged with on this. For example, um, a lot of the student, uh, the SOS work that we do, there's a lot of university students who are naturally gonna progress into this space. Um, but there's also a huge element of social mobility here and reaching out to communities um, wider than a university pool um, from other parts of academic backgrounds, internships, apprentice apprenticeships, who are equally skillful um, and I think outreach is needed within those communities to truly diversify. Um, and I would, yeah, I would look at those kind of organizations that are making that work. Can I be controversial, Manu? Because I, I, I don't think there is a magic pill. And I think if we, this is complex work and um, this isn't about a magic pill, it's about commitment. Um, and yes, there are clear routes and there are routes that can be developed. But if, if people are thinking, where's the magic bullet? I hate to disappoint you, you won't find it <laughs> because there isn't one. That's my personal view, but happy to be disagreed with. Thanks, Ravani. I think, uh, yeah, the magic pill is never really as magic as it seems. But um, there are definitely some big acts we can take. Uh, very, very quickly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide in one last question here. And if anybody who presses the buzzer quickly enough, do you have any advice for organizations imp on improving their data collection and reporting? What's a thing that organizations could do to improve how they collect their data? I think that's an SOS question because you're, you're, you've driven this work. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll answer it, Rajni, if you, if, you, if you don't mind. I, I've done a lot of benchmarking with, with all sorts of organizations from the largest environmental organizations in the country to you know, small, small groups. And I think planning is a big, big part of it. I think often organizations will react to a request for data rather than to look at the data and why it's important to have that data and to include it within a bigger strategic piece. I think if you plan for it, then it's a lot less hassle. It's a lot less pressure on your HR. If you've got an HR department, it's a lot less uh, pressure on your staff or you're asking to give that data. And so I think planning is the, is, is the biggest, biggest bit of the, of the puzzle. I think um, another part of it is having very strong governance around data collection. If you don't have governance and accountability, then it's just something we forgot to do last year. We might do it again next year. And, and the final bit for me is buy-in. It's getting the buy-in from your staff. It's getting the buy-in from your volunteers, from your trustees, making sure that they understand that the, it's not just a tick box exercise. This is why you're collecting the data this is what the potential impact for the organization, for the staff, for the communities we're working with, uh, is, and and then yeah, I think I, I think you know amongst other things, I think you've got a much better chance then of of delivering on 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 data collection. Um, there are loads and loads of standardized ways of doing it out there that are not too onerous. Really figuring out the way in which you can do it in a way that's effective and efficient. 
I think is a, is a key part to this. We are running out of time and I feel like we could chat forever and ever as I enjoy chatting with all three of you, but we are at the, at the very end. I'm gonna hand over to, to Meg, who is going to very briefly talk to us about next steps and where we go from here. Yeah, massive thank you to the panel. Like you've all been fantastic, really, really valuable insights. And um, I too would love to like mirror that virtual high five to every single organization that submitted data. It's big, it's bold to take part in the first year of something like this, but it's only by taking part that we can drive the sector forward. So um, yeah, really pleased to see that support. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us. I've seen some comments in the Q&A that some of you maybe hadn't heard of the race report prior to this. So like, let's take this opportunity to share knowledge and awareness of the race report with your networks. Um, we've been posting on social media. Please do reshare if you're able to. And um, any articles that you see in the media, if you can share that, speak with your CEOs, speak with your trustees, speak to your networks and try to grow that engagement with the race report and therefore drive forward diversity and inclusion in the sector. Um, we've opened expressions of interest for 2023. If you go to the website address is actually wrong on this, I've just noticed. It's racereport.uk, not .org. So please do go to our website and you can submit your expression of interest for taking part in 2023. In early 2023, we will launch the timeline for next year's race report. Um, so yeah, sign up and then we'll keep you posted with next steps. And if you can share your immediate reactions to the race report 2022, we've created a Slido and I believe that the links for that should be put in the chat or in the Q&A for you to be able to access. But if you go to slido.com and then put in the code 2676614 or scan the QR code, we would really, really value your immediate responses to what you've heard today and what you can see in the data, because that helps us understand what the sector can see and what your impression is of this work. Um, yep. So without further ado, like, thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. And please do shout about this work so that we get more people involved in creating this change. Thank you.